Again, my name is uh, Eric Raboon. I am the National Director for Enclosure Engineering at Walsh P. Moore. Um, and I'm really um, happy to be um, moderating this panel. Um, this uh, Omar mentioned that we have been involved um, since the inception of the, of the event. Uh, but this, this panel is not about me. It's about um, the, 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 the bunch of, of uh, engineers and consultants um, that, uh, that have been involved with ACAW this year and, and in past years. Um, yeah, Omar mentioned that we've been involved from the beginning and it's been a, in a fantastic run. Um, you know, uh, and uh, it's, you know, from, from the day, first, first year in 2016 when we were um, just playing with clay to um, all in a number of different teams in various years, um, uh, uh, engineering and helping to you know, define um, these, these installations that we've been working on. So, you know, I wanted to say, um, you know, first, Mick, thanks for the great presentation. Um, always learn something, uh, a little something new every time I, I hear you present. So I'm always uh, invigorated when, you, when, you, when I hear you speak. Um, and, uh, and thank you to Boston Valley and to Omar for um, keeping us um, involved in the, in the, in the workshop um, uh, and as a sponsor for the event. Um, also going to say that I'm absolutely blown away by the work that's presented this year. Um, definitely raised the bar. Um, and, you know, uh, as you can see, a lot of the, the presenters in these, uh, in these teams are the architects. So um, the goal of this, of this panel was to give the, uh, the engineers and the consultants on those teams an opportunity to give their perspective as well. So I don't. I should have probably collaborated with John Neary before, you know, presenting my little bit of uh, history about terracotta. But I'm going to keep it brief um, and just talk about it in the context of, of you know, the, the the topic of this panel, which is which is the engineer or the consultant's perspective. Um, you know, if we take a brief look back at the at the evolution of of terracotta through history, we can see early examples dating back to the fifth century where the material was used primarily in a sculptural manner, um, largely within brick buildings. Um, later on, we start seeing, you know, in, 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 in the UK, um, uh, as well as um, early, early in the United States, where um, we see, you know, the use of terracotta also as a cladding material, but, um, but used, again, more sculturally, not necessarily as a, as a, a sort of um, a building product or a building system. Um, in 1722, um, uh, uh, Englishman Richard Holt and, and Thomas Ripley patented a recipe for artificial stone, which became, you know, what we know as, as terracotta and what's used on the Natural History Museum there. And similarly, in the United States, projects became, uh, uh, became started to use more terracotta uh, in their systems as a replacement for, uh, for stone. Um, and build, uh, but the architects no longer, and builders had no longer had to re rely on procuring the product from Europe. Um, but actually it was made more local uh, by local manufacturers such as uh, Henry Tolman based in Worcester, uh, Massachusetts. And we are all, you know, very well, um, you know, everybody in the industry has been trained in, in architectural engineering are probably well aware of the Chicago fire of 1871 and how that sort of impacted our industry. Um, but it's important to note that in addition to the subsequent, you know, changes um, in, the, in the use of cast iron as a build for building structures, terracotta was also uh, heavily, you know, um, uh, marketed for the use of as a lightweight, moldable, uh, and fire and pollution resistant material um, that could be mass produced and to create more buildings that are more resilient, right? So we talk about resiliency um, in the context of uh, what Mick was um, uh, presenting. Um, you know, terracotta has always been, 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 uh, been presented as that. So we see here, you know, as a legitimate building material rather than as an imitation to stone. And then during that time, we also started seeing terracotta as a structural material, uh, more use as a structural material, where um, you get uh, examples like the Guastavino uh, vaults, where he brought his Mediterranean style of, of thin ceramic tile vaulting uh, to the United States, um, where the, he applied uh, multiple layers of, uh, of terracotta um, uh, tiles and bonded by mortar, and that achieved uh, these sort of long span, long span archers. And early examples, you know, um, uh, while while you know hugely uh, uh, it's a structural innovative feat, um, you know they, they weren't necessarily expressed on the underside. They usually was plaster or or a, a ceramic tile on the underside that gave it that that covered it. And then it wasn't until later um, that they started expressing that that tiling, that the sort of herringbone tiling pattern on the inside. Um, but what we like to see here, or what's what's really exciting here, is that you know we're really using um, the terracotta. Uh, components as a structural kind of main building component. Um, you know, while the popularity um, increased during this time, 
um, the industry started to realize, you know, the aftermath of what um, uh, what was, you know, uh, what what happened after using this kind of experimental material, uh, building material, right? So installations, uh, issues with insulation and water penetration that causes corrosion of, of uh, interior metals, um, caused the organization of the National Terracotta, Terracotta Society, um, which published two widely used standards in 1914, 1924, that detailed construction methods, waterproofing and, and maintenance. And around the same time, we also see um, uh, marketers of, uh, of the products that are um, actually including load and span tables in their materials. So we start seeing this as a, as a milestone in which the, you know, uh, the products being used as building material, but also there's a specialty knowledge in the use of this material that, that brings on the use of engineers um, or the necessity for engineers and consultants. So we start seeing, you know, the traditional um, uh, methods for, uh, um, for you know, the, the enclosure systems and cladding systems being replaced by more contemporary ones where we have multiple control layers, but really looking the same. And you know, that can still be seen today actually where you know, this is a project that, that Andre on the panel um, uh, may have a slide on, which is a very kind of historic look, but, but actually um, the uh, you know, use of a, a more contemporary um, multi-layered um, uh, enclosure system. Then we get the use of the uh, of kind of more conventional uh, cavity wall constructions, and then um, you know that's being that was heavily used in in Germany um, uh, back in the 80s and uh, 90s, where where I got my first exposure to to the use of terracotta, and then you know through Boston Valley, really invigorating the the rain screen application and really pushing the 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 the, the process and the and the application forward by taking you know a more novel approach to. Um, to uh, you know the way that the terracotta can be formed, manufactured, assembled, and and uh, and hung. So you know, in the context of this, you know discussing the evolving cladding strategies and the role of the consultant, you know, the trends that I've been seeing um, uh, fairly recently is uh, kind of the resurgence of the of the material that revolves around the buildings, uh, the material's ability to meet um, evolving formal and functional expectations, but also. Um, ones that are validated by engineering principles. And so that's what we're hoping to discuss today. So at this point, I'm gonna give the floor over to our panelists to give a brief presentation on their roles um, as the expert consultant or engineer um, uh, in, the, in the projects that they've worked on or on these installations within, um, uh, within ACOL. Um, Andre uh, Parther is an associate with the facade engineering team at Bureau Happel in New York City. Uh, he specializes on investigations and restoration of building envelopes and has contributed his knowledge on the design and engineering of new construction projects as well. Brett Laurie is a principal and associate director of uh, project operations with, with Jenny Elsner in Chicago and focuses on building assessments and restorations. Kaisal Rawi um, with uh, Walsh P. Moore is a senior associate in the LA office and design team leader. Um, he specializes in the design of new enclosure systems using innovative materials and construction techniques. David Bott, a principal with Heinges in New York City who has extensive experience with custom design building enclosures um, and is well versed in the design of engineering and specialty structures, including glass, cable nets, and tension members. And Eric Farrington, associate principal at Simpson Gilbert Hager in Boston, who has a broad experience with structural design of new construction and the repair and re rehabilitation of existing buildings, uh, structures, and enclosure. So at that point, uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to our first panelist. Um, are you guys ready to, um, to present? And then I will stop sharing my screen. The first one presenting will be uh, Eric with SGH. Let me figure out how to stop presenting my screen. Oh, I think it's stuck, Eric. Yeah, yeah, no, I was stuck. Sorry, couldn't oh, find the oh, couldn't find the button. <laughs> Let's see if I have the. Uh, just make sure. Okay, so um, thanks, Eric. Uh, as you said, I'm uh, Associate Principal at Simpson, Gumpert, and Hager. Hey, Eric, uh, just before you start, I wanna make sure, can you swap your, your display? We're looking at the notes. Oh, you're looking at portion. the notes only. All right, yep. let me, uh, sorry about that. Screen two. Perfect. How's that? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Awesome, okay. Uh, now it won't. Advance. Here we go. 
Uh, so SGH is a national engineering firm that uh, designs, investigates, and rehabilitates building enclosures. And I wear a few hats there, but what brings me to ACAW is uh, my work uh, at SGH on multidisciplinary structure and envelope teams tackling integrated repairs, uh, particularly with the rehabilitation of historic building exteriors. Um, so I worked with the Goody Clancy team, uh, helping them with the, the structural aspects of their system. Uh, just a little uh, a reminder with their presentation, they looked at the assembly as a whole, uh, looking at passive house standards and thermally isolating the terracotta. Uh, and they wanted to focus on creative solutions in the terracotta, but keep by keeping costs, uh, cost effective solutions using the standardized systems to support the terracotta. Um, so that was these customized rain screen panels that they showed, uh, a, a standard horizontal rail system, thermally isolated standoffs uh, or the typical backup of you know, metal stud backup walls and then using interior and exterior insulation. Uh, and the, the kink that they threw into that structurally was the integrated planter system uh, at, at the jam, which needed a, a specialized support that would, that would fall outside of that standardized system. And so that specialized attachment needed, we need to make sure that that uh, wouldn't interfere with the standardized support systems. And, and this sort of leads me to what the piece that I wanted to talk about uh, today, which is coordination uh, of, of the, these various systems and how uh, a specialized support like this really needs to be well detailed and coordinated in the construction documents because the final design of several of these elements are typically done by different entities. And so uh, how do we do that here, uh, that planter, uh, this is sort of like an elevation of it. And so how do we tie that, that, that uh, specialized support into the overall system uh, without interference? Uh, we have, here's the, that standard jam tile and the planter tile. And we came up with this outrigger system. It's a little bit different in the mock-up, but in the system that would work for uh, going onto a building elevation, that outrigger ties uh, across a vertical jam element here and uh and then would a bat would backspan behind the rest of the system what that looks like in plan uh is that you have your fairly typical uh, metal stud backup wall and here are the the standoffs that hold the horizontal rail system that the that captures the typical tiles and then here's that outrigger uh, reaching out to grab hold of that and support that planter and you know the it works fairly easily to support the planter for gravity loads. And the thing that we run into trouble with is wind loads on those planters and sort of these in and out forces that we've got to, we've got to deal with. And the resultant of those uh, is structure coordinating to the backup structure at the jam and actually at the next stud in. And so the important, uh, important thing with coordination and detailing here is so that the designers of each of these systems understand where the loads are going and where it's expected that there's amplified structure to support these things. So here's the another image of the of the mock-up with the a modified outrigger um, for the more simplified mock-up construction. Uh, and then just the key takeaways around coordination is you can still be creative within the confines of standard systems, uh, which I, I think the team uh, found out. And um, it's important to coordinate the load path completely. Properly detailing the load path allows the various uh, designers along the way to understand the coordination that's intended. Uh, and all of this is bulwarked by detailed review of delegated design submittals to verify this coordination is actually happen happening uh, in the final design process that's uh, essential for successful construction of the system. Uh, so thanks, and I think I'm handing off to Andre. I can stop sharing. Sorry. Correct. You're up, Andre. Can you guys see my screen? We see a PDF uh, in a with within the window, the blue beam, the blue beam window. Okay, give me one second.
So you're still seeing the PDF? Correct. Okay. Yeah, once I go to presentation mode, it kind of kicks me out. Okay, so um, working with working with um, Cookfox on their design, um, representing Borahapple, we are, give me one second, guys. Would full screen even help you instead of presentation? Yeah, let me try that. I think it was right next to presentation under, under full screen. Is that better? Uh, still a little too small. Do you want to try and do the view like you had before the view? full screen, go to the view option along the top. Yeah. And I think, I think it says full screen, but I can't really read. Full screen, cross here. Is that better? No, uh, that was just crosshair. So I, I would just uh, maximize it in your window, Andre. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, do this. Let me change screens. How's that? Is that better? Better. Yeah, I think, uh, I think just go ahead. Yeah. Okay, cool. So here at Borahapple, we working for the facade team. We are also multidisciplinary. And we see the coordination between building facades, facades lighting, sustainability, resiliency, waste management. Um, now I want to advance. Okay, guys, give me one second. Let me. Share. Okay. If, if when you hit yeah. present, hit like go stop your screen share and then go to your window and hit present and then open up Zoom and try to share the window that, that is just a shared presentation. I think that that might be an option. And, and there's a comment to hit F11. That might be a shortcut for full screen too. Okay, do you guys see it? We're, we're just seeing your desktop, blank desktop. I think, there we go. There we go. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Excellent, so, all right, excellent. So um, we've done a couple projects with Cook Fox. One is the 512 West 22nd Street. This was a traditional rain screen terracotta application. Next one is the one that Eric mentioned, the Fitzroy, which is a more traditional terracotta application, which involves, um, you know, gravity set masonry, blocks of terracotta anchored back to the facade structure. A uh, couple of shots of the different levels of, of coordination as far as shop drawings and uh, finished product. We've also worked on 111 West 7th Street, which was more a curtain wall panel system, including terracotta. Um, our project with Cook Fox involved a biophilic screen, which originally we had imagined this as a screen with the modules set with um, a steel frame in each frame and collectively four, per, four frames per, per rectangle. As we got into the design, we imagined different clips, stainless steel clips, which hold the terracotta in the frames. As we got into building the actual mock-up, 
um, for efficiency, we decided to remove the metal frame and focus on connections between each module. This brought us to analyzing the efficient areas of the models so that we could attach them and bolt them together. One of the key constraints here was access, making sure we had access into the module to bolt and you know, adjust the bolts and insert the bolts. So we went through a process of rationalizing each, each and analyzing each, each pod and making sure that we had a consistent access between all different layers. You can see some of the typical connections because we have accesses that meet at four point between four units. And then we have other, other conditions where they're butted up against each other. Attachment to the frame so that basically the, the, the exhibit would be able to hold itself. Um, some of our design, we, because the glaze was a huge part of this um, technically. So we designed these ribs, concave and convex ribs to hold the mold, to hold the glaze as part of the mold. And you can see the effect here. So that we can take full advantage of the ongo, the assembly, laying out the first rows of terracotta mullions, mullions were, was, was essential because it basically supported the whole, the whole lot. And here you can see a cut section. One of the things that we observed during installation was basically, since most of the terracotta was fastened at the back, the mortar, we, they need to shim, we need to shim the front. So if we were to do this large scale again, we, we'd have to incorporate little feet on the terracotta, the front of the terracotta panels, as well as mortar in the joints so that therefore they could fully sit and we could fully get weight distribution from unit to unit. And that's it. Next is... All right. Yep, we have uh, Brett. Thanks, Andre. All right, <clears throat> you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right. All right, how's that working, okay? Great. Yep. All right. So thank you everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity. Uh, you know, somewhat different from uh, others on this panel, WJ's expertise uh, in terracotta facade engineering is really related to the failure of existing buildings and, and structures. You know, day to day, we deal with the challenges of, of restoring some of these iconic terracotta buildings all over the country. And, and we also have been uh, working on helping with some failures of some more modern buildings as well. So honestly, we try to use uh, more of our experience from the past to educate our, our future design. So uh, today, I'd like to focus a little bit on historic facades, which is more of my uh, expertise. And I'll give you a little quick case study, but really we find that coordination and timeliness is really key. Uh, you know, we're trying to use more newer technologies to improve on fabrication times, reduce labor in the field for removal of pieces and replication of pieces. We're trying to integrate more modern materials into wall systems for durability. We're continually trying to stay up on new materials and methods for the fabrication and installation of terracotta, trying to use this material as much as we possibly can. And, and honestly, no two jobs are the same and, and we're really constantly with, challenged with thinking outside the box for the repairs that we need to come up with. There are two main challenges that I see with historic facades and it ultimately comes down to cost for both of them. First, I'll, I'm gonna touch on is labor. Uh, you know, creativity in our design is huge when it comes to reducing uh, labor costs, having that experience. You know, for example, this is a large corner rebuild. Uh, we've expedited it by using uh, some simpler and repetitive anchorage design using vertical stainless steel unistruts. Uh, we're trying to balance the, get a standard anchor depth. This corner, uh, the labor time for rebuilding this corner goes uh, down significantly when it comes to using uh, extruded materials as well. Uh, the other challenge is uh, really about fabrication time and methods. You know, we're bringing down, trying to bring down material costs. We're trying to uh, increase fabricate or uh, reduce fabrication times of when that's going to be a piece comes off the building and back on the site. Um, and, and that comes down to extrusion. Uh, extrusion plays a big role in that. Uh, extrusion units have their limitations for size and profile, but they can also be very effective at reducing lead times and costs. 
extruded units, uh, you know, present some challenges when it comes to conventional anchorage because of the cellular profile. Um, and I think as Eric showed earlier, uh, we've been working with IMI uh, and Boston Valley Terracotta to come up with new anchorage schemes, come up with some standard schemes. The 1914 and 1927 documents were used quite often, and we're trying to replicate that with some of the new uh, modern systems that are out there. So today I just want to quickly touch on one project we worked on with Boston Valley. This was a design build project at the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta. The upper portion here in uh, designated in the orange uh, shading uh, was put in the bridging documents on the RFP uh, for this design build to be completely removed from the building and replaced with uh, GFRC, with a panelized GFRC system. Ultimately, before this job was uh, was finalized, and as we put our RFP submittal, we did our homework. And you know, it's a reinforced concrete structure with a mass wall backup. Uh, the reality and practicality of trying to maintain an active uh, courthouse or an active building uh, while removing the entire area from the ninth floor cornice up to the top of the pediment really isn't practical. And honestly, from preservation standards, uh, it's a terrible idea. So we found out that the majority of this, which we felt from our inspections, is it was in, in good shape. Uh, the main problem uh, was the cornice, and that's what I want to touch on real quick. Uh, the cornice existing conditions, we had these 650 pound brackets that were hung from the existing structure. It was co reinforced concrete structure and then there was steel that armatures that came down and supported those units. Uh, also uh, the three course uh, cornice up above, uh, there was significant leakage in this gutter over many decades, which was causing severe corrosion and displacement and cracking, which you can kind of see in these photographs here. Uh, with Boston Valley, we developed a, a program to come in and there's about 550 feet of this cornice that was going to be taken down and rebuilt. Uh, from a labor perspective, it was easier to disassemble it and go back with, the, with new pieces. Uh, the new pieces then were, were extruded and we developed an anchoring scheme with Boston Valley to uh, put this back in place. One of the key things I just want to touch on, especially in a design build project, which is honestly not that common for restoration, is the timeliness. And we used the uh, technology to the best we could. Um, and using something as simple as, as plan grid, we, we were doing our surveys and identifying pieces. Um, and within the next day, uh, Boston Valley had their team out doing the final surveys and, and helping develop the uh, shop drawing. So there was a lot of coordination. We learned a lot of things from the design build process and uh, using technology to help us. From the cornice reassembly, uh, there was quite a bit of uh, design that had to happen on the fly. Uh, these were large steel channel sections that came out and picked up these large uh, brackets, the 650 pound brackets. Uh, in some places though, that uh, steel was completely gone and the hangers were gone. So in most cases, these were removed. We put in new HSS sections designed uh, new connections up to the concrete structure and, and rehung those pieces. There was a lot of creativity of using, you know, motor jacks and motor, mo motor hoist to, to lift these in place up and underneath the concrete structure. And probably one of the most, I, I'd say, I don't know if necessarily an innovative, but we tried to save time and cost for the contractor and ultimately for the team. Uh, we used extruded units on the upper three courses. And within those three uh, courses, uh, we integrated in slots and anchor holes and things that could go into the extrusion die uh, to strap these back to the building. We also uh, used a little slot up in the top so we weren't anchoring itself into the terracotta for the, the roofing and gutter attachments. Um, again, most of this was uh, repetitive in nature and we were able to uh, use extrusion methods to kind of help us through uh, the process and improve on the anchorage and, and the speed of installation. Overall, the courthouse is now complete. Scaffolds started coming down actually last week. And uh, as you could see, the cornice uh, it, in our eyes turned out great. Uh, it was complete, uh, complete removal and replacement of that cornice. Just a couple other, you know, historic projects. This is what our focus is and, you know, I. I love what Mick was saying about uh, trying to use some of these existing buildings. I think it's the best way we can uh, save on our uh, on our emissions uh, emissions. So this is the Dade County Courthouse and Louis Sullivan's Jewel Box Bank and the Steuben Club uh, in Chicago.
So that's all I got. I think I'm turning it over to uh, Gene, I believe. Gene, yeah, Gene is going to be um, pushing the slides. And I think, David, you're also going to be speaking. So, yes, hello. All right. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to briefly discuss Heinz's recent experiences with physical testing of architectural terracotta and also touch upon some of the analytical methods we use to assess the material and its supports. We believe that both physical testing and analysis are imperative to successful facade design. So beginning with physical testing, this first slide shows the setting of curtain wall units at a performance mock-up for a new commercial project in New York City called Project Galaxy. The column areas and spandrel zones are clad with a rain screen of individually supported extruded hollow terracotta tiles. The tile pieces include curved and flat profiles of up to five feet in length. Uh, the terracotta rain screen assembly is anchored with through body fasteners and joined to integral aluminum supports, which are then clipped to aluminum subframing within the curtain wall. This allows for individual removal or replacement of tiles. And tiles also include an aluminum reinforcement bar running through the interior hollow sections and securely attached to the backup framing structure. So in the event of terracotta breakage, the tiles would still be retained. So when we test these systems, we go through a variety of tests. And this slide here is showing uh, a lateral movement test to simulate interstory drift in both wind and seismic events. In this image, you see an induced horizontal seismic movement at the second level floor slab of two and a half inches. The test specimen is cycled back and forth 10 times to ensure that none of the terracotta components disengage. Uh, the next type of testing we do is structural uniform loading of the rain screen panels themselves, which is to simulate wind loads acting on the terracotta from the exterior. Because it's an open, you know, because the joints of the rain screen are open, the way this test is performed is by constructing a chamber on the outside of the terracotta and taping the terracotta kind of joints. Then the chamber interior is positively and negatively pressurized to simulate maximum expected wind pressures and suctions on the terracotta. And in this way, we can you know, push it to the maximum you know, pressure or suction and, and make sure that the terracotta remains attached to its supporting structure. The next image shows soft body impact testing of the terracotta, which was also performed to simulate the potential, potential for building maintenance equipment equipment to impact the wall. So since an equivalent ASTM standard does not exist, the TN76 standard from the UK is typically used for this kind of testing. So the soft body itself is comprised of a polyethylene bag filled with three millimeter diameter glass spheres and weighing 50 kilograms. The bag's hoisted to a specified drop height and then released to impart an impact force to the terracotta. The higher the drop height, the greater the energy of the impact. Three impacts constitute a single test. And here the impact energy was calibrated to the worst case impact from building maintenance. Here's a little short video of the test. What you'll see is, um, let's see here if I can drop it. There we go. Not, not super exciting, but we like that because uh, we want the terracotta to remain intact and stay on the building. So um, the next type of test is a hard body impact test. This test is similar to the soft body test, except in this case, the hard body consists of a 50 millimeter diameter solid steel sphere weighing half a kilogram. And the drop height is increased for each test. So it increases the impact energy from three to six to 10 joules respectively. Although you can see here in the lower right image that a hole occurred in the terracotta during the final test, the panel overall remained intact. So this localized failure was deemed a pass. Um, moving on now from physical testing to analytical testing, we'll use the ACA project that we developed in collaboration with ARO and TriPyramid as the example. So as we presented earlier in the day, the curtain-like terracotta briselet is supported on short struts spanning a double layer tension net structure. Um, so when we go to analyze, First, we started with the net. So these images show the stress and deflection analysis of the double layer tension net under wind load 
assumed to be installed on a 54 foot tall by 54 foot wide building facade. The net would be pre-stressed to control, control deflection and periodically attached to floor slab edges as well to the continuous perimeter framing. Note that the deflected shape of the net in the image to the left is exaggerated. The actual deflection is controlled to be a maximum of L over 60, or in this case, three inches, which is a typical uh, criteria used for most cable net structures in facade systems. Now, to analyze the terracotta modules, we utilized finite element analysis software and imported the 3D geometry from Rhino to create the solid model. We introduced supports in the model, applied gravity load to understand its dead load stress, and determine the reactions applied to the supporting net structure. Uh, we then analyzed the model under wind load and studied the results to check stresses at the surface and within the body of the terracotta. Boston Valley assisted by providing maximum allowable stress limits obtained through their own physical testing of the terracotta. So their physical testing of the terracotta is informing the analytical testing, so to speak, of the analysis model. So under the assumed 50 PSF wind load, our maximum surface stresses were within allowable limits, with the highest stresses located at the interior angle of the element, which is indicated in the image on the upper right. Uh, this angle could also be modified to reduce stress. If, for example, we had higher wind loads, the, a greater radius and a greater angle would decrease the intensity of the stress at that location. So turning towards the lower right image, we see a more detailed study of stress planes within the solid model, enabling us to look closely at any area of interest. And on the following slide, we can see multiple interior planes reviewed for stress, cutting across the terracotta model in various orientations. And I think we have another animation here on the right. Yeah. So that's about it for this presentation. So hopefully that gave you a little taste of the ways in which we can physically and analytically test terracotta. Uh, we're looking forward to pushing the terracotta envelope further on future facade projects. And thanks for watching. Thanks, David. Kais, we're going to turn it over to you. Um, and as Kais is pulling it up, I'm just going to say that what, what Kais is going to present is a project that uh, we currently are working on. It's under construction um, here at Walter P. Moore. Um, and it's, it was born out of ACAW. Um, at least the, the cladding was, let's say. Um, so I'll let, I'll let Kais present it. Okay, can you see my full screen? You can, yes, thanks Kais. All right, perfect. So yeah, as Eric mentioned, this is a project we've been working on for a few years, the Orange County Museum of Art, uh, where Morphosis are the architects and Walt P. Moore is the enclosure consultant. It's a new home for the museum uh, in Costa Mesa in California and the majority of the facades are going to be terracotta clad and early in the process we started looking at uh, conventional terracotta systems that use standardized rails and components and how we could uh, apply a system like that onto this project. However, one of the main challenges is the geometry and form of the building and what you can see here is that the, the design surface is comprised of flat and curved surfaces. And uh, some of them are flat vertical, some are flat inclined, uh, and then all the curved parts are actually single curved. So they are extruded radial arcs, but they're also at all kinds of different orientations. And one of the design intentions early on was to uh, really take the terracotta from one end of the building and continue that tiling pattern throughout these surfaces and, and have the tiling pattern flow along these and how they curve and tilt, uh, which is a unique feature. Uh, however, we also did not want to see clear break lines where it curved. We, we wanted that the, the tiles were continuous throughout these surfaces and you wouldn't be able to read uh, where exactly it's, it's splitting. And, in terracotta, we usually have flat tiles and we have single curve tiles and maybe custom slump tiles. But here we wanted tiles that are part flat and part curved that make that transition and then switch to fully curved tiles and then back to the transition and back to flat. So ACAW was, was really a, a great avenue to pursue this idea. Uh, and uh, this was a few years ago with the Morphosis team where slumping these tiles on a mold was explored. 
And you can uh, see here how that was done before uh, they were put in the oven and getting that shape and then um, getting a tile that has both. So quite a unique uh, process that was tried here. Uh, fast forward into the project, we were able to take this process and also um, incorporate in the documents and get Boston Valley Terracotta on board where uh, recently a uh, visual mock-up was completed that, that you see over here. And one of the key elements is really trying to maintain uh, a standard or, or somewhat standard uh, attachment system back to the backup wall, uh, which also meant that the backup wall had to have this uh, geometry. Another complexity within this is also the top and side edges because um, of the way the facade terminated, that meant we had some slivers and, and some unique cuts. And of course, as you curve and tilt the facade, these start to be some special miters. So to get to a, a backup substrate that follows the surface and for us to use a conventional system, we developed a secondary steel system that did that. And, and what was unique about the secondary steel system is it also uh, supported the glazing system. We have long span glazing at the entrance of the museum and we wanted the two to integrate really well and, and not have differential movements and big joints between the two. So the secondary steel was developed in a way such that we could align its members uh, along where the glazing occurs and have it do that double duty. In this image, you can kind of see all of these overlaid together. And, and this was something figured out early on in the design process and documented uh, within our drawings, including uh, framing elevations and reactions, uh, but also going into the details where you have these um, tricky interfaces between the two systems and how we can get everything to, um, to line up and have that steel work for both. The project is currently under construction and the secondary steel install is near completion. Clark Construction is executing the project and uh, we just very recently started some of the terracotta install on some of the flat portions of the building and uh, we'll be within the next few weeks and months looking at uh, installing it on more on some of the more complex parts. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Kais. All right, now um, we're gonna go into a panel discussion and uh, this is meant to be an open dialogue. Um, I have a number of uh, questions. Oops, there goes my timer. Um, a number of questions that I, are, uh, uh, I have prepared for uh, the panelists, um, but um, by all means, if the audience has questions based on what they saw presented uh, or what was presented by the um, design team earlier on um, and focused to the consultants, um, please put them into uh, the chat window and I will relay them uh, to the design, to the panelists. So um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kick off and, uh, and um, you know, I, uh, if, if I can, I'll, I'll relate these to this, any specific panelists, but, uh, um, but I welcome any of the panelists to, um, to chime in. Um, so one of the things I think kind of playing off the last presentation, Kais, um, since we'll start there, um, you know, some of the, uh, some of, uh, actually many of you presented examples uh, of work that use terracotta designed by teams that have not used terracotta um, pre like uh, substantially in their past, but are asking for the materials to meet similar um, formal aspirations. Uh, what are some lessons learned within these teams, um, uh, uh, within these teams that the, you know, in the, uh, as far as the way that terracotta is formed um, or has been used in the, you know, how, how it can be used in the future, um, any sort of um, lessons learned from that from that uh, experience. Sure, I'll I'll start off. I mean, it's it's quite a unique material to work with. It was you know one one of the first times we've explored it on a project specialty with a geometrical complexity. But um, I I think one of our lessons learned is you know trying to keep it within a standardized system or alternatively a unitized system. They're kind of two approaches that, that we've looked at and it really comes to depend on uh, how much repeatability you have on your project and also the scale of the project uh, to which avenue you take. Uh, 
but figuring out how it works in a long span facade or, or going over multiple levels is something important to uh, to resolve during the design phase uh, as a rain screen material to make sure you don't have uh, large movement joints and things like that between levels. Uh, hence the approach I presented with, with secondary uh, steel in this case. Fantastic, thank you. Is there anybody who wanted to contribute to that? Otherwise I'll move on to my next question. I'll, I'll jump in on that, Eric, because one of the things that the Goody Clancy team uh, ran, it, ran into that was, uh, I think, a learning experience for us all and had to work closely with Boston Valley to understand this was sort of the, you know, there's, we always think about, you know, how do you make the elements and then how do they, how is it that they uh, perform once they're on the building? But that, that green state step of uh, the forming uh, and then to get into the firing uh, actually ended up driving the design to some degree because there was a, there was a, there was a, as I think uh, David mentioned, not, not an about face, but a pivot where they, they were looking to get something that was a little bit more, uh, uh, more open with much smaller and smaller and smaller terracotta elements until we got to the point where it would not be able to hold itself up to, uh, during, the, during the fabrication process. So understanding that and really working with uh, Boston Valley to understand, uh, you know, is that a limitation or is that a, is that a, design, um, uh, a design selection? Um, how, they, how, how that affects what you can produce. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that I think a lot of people that, that haven't worked with terracotta in the past don't um, appreciate until they, they've actually done it is that there is that transition period between, you know, the wet state and then the, the fired state, right, that, that has an effect on the form and obviously the, the, the characteristics of the, uh, of the terracotta. So you have to anticipate that. Um, and uh, obviously there's, there's additional, you know, um, there's 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 known um, forming techniques, and then there's there's novel ones that are being you know that were actually some some of which were presented by uh, the UB team right that that Boston Valley had uh, um, uh, had developed in their in their shops. Um, so I think that's uh, that's that's a good point that you make that um, there are a lot of a lot of things that just in the process of manufacturing and 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 uh, and fabricating that um, other other materials may not have the same constraints. And I jump in there to say that's one of the things that is, is, it makes it a pleasure to work with Boston Valley because I think Andrew, Andrew Price is really instrumental, I think, in at least with our team and coaching us through that as we evolve the design, especially in, you know, in determining minimum sizes for the walls of the terracotta, um, keeping the support walls on the interior and spreading them out so that you know, the, the unit can support itself. So that's a key, a key, a key, a key lesson. Yeah, that's yeah, a good Eric. I guess, I guess I'd say from the restoration side too, that's one thing that we've, we've learned to bring to some of these innovative designs, even when we're innovating new pieces for restoration and some of them get very large, it's, it's the coordination of the team. The team is, you know, as Andre said, the team is very important to making this successful and, and having the right pieces for it. So just can't reiterate that enough. It's something that you know, maybe some owners don't always want to pay for, but it's the most important part of a, a team approach to this. Yeah, Brett, I mean, you guys are, uh, I feel like in, in the work that you do um, and others on the on the panel that, that deal with restoration, I think your team expands or, or beyond the people that sit around you um, and that are involved in the project. I feel like your team is um, involves those that are that we're involved in the project from the start, right? Or at least everybody that's touched that project since it's since, since it was built, right? You're learning from uh, those drawings, from those uh, that you might find. You're learning from those from the you know Terracotta Society um, documentation, um, from probes. Uh, so it's it's almost like uh, having a, a ghost next to you, right? That uh, that you have to you have to work with in the process of of the restoration work. Yeah, I'd always I'd always rather learn from others' mistakes than ours, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, I think th th that was one of my questions was that um, in the, you know, uh, a lot of the work that gets that gets proposed um, uh, and presented at ACAW is, is, you know, contemporary, you know, modern projects using, you know, using modern systems. So, you know, knowing, you know, as someone who, who is, you know, I think it's always, fa it's always fascinating to me to have someone like yourself, um, you know, in the team because you, you learn so much from what has failed in the past. So, you know, 
knowing knowing what we know about the the redundancy and the efficiencies of of new systems um what kind of advice would you give to designers of contemporary systems? Um, uh, because you, I mean, obviously you mentioned that you are working on both historic buildings as well as failures of fairly new buildings. Is there anything that we could be learned that we can we could learn from that process as well that we aren't really, you know, capturing right now in our process? Well, I think it's things like uh, ACOF, for example, of everybody learning more about the material and understanding its its pluses and minuses. Um, you know, we. As Andre said, I, you have to realize that this is becoming a team effort and it has to continue that way. And we've learned that from restoration. Um, and even mm -hmm. some of the new designs that we've seen, there's always a gap, right? There's a gap in between uh, somebody reviewing this component of it and this component, those two things go together and those interfaces of what becomes the problem. So I guess the one thing that I've always tried to iterate to our staff and to our, our teams and teams that we're working with in the future is we got to have good communication. It's simple, but it's good communication. It's understanding the material and, and um, being up to date on what's going on in the industry. And, and again, that's why I, I was involved with ACA a number of years and, and more with some of the, from the newer designs. And, and I did bring a different perspective and it comes down to the, the, pieces how they're made and and the anchorage of those pieces and then the limitations that are there so it's it's continuing to learn and everyone's different isn't that that's why we all love it every yeah. every, every project's going to be a little different absolutely well speaking of learning i want to ask david uh um you know i think your your slides were were really fantastic in the sense that they um they described a process which is which is largely largely hidden to um the larger audience right um of making sure the wacky ideas that we put on paper and we allow our design teams to move forward with are actually validated, right? So, um, you know, uh, I think it was it was really nice to see that you know there are standard tests uh, available, right? But you mentioned that there's also you know tests that you have to come up with and and tweak. So, you know, um, my question is like, in what ways are new concepts validated to assure resiliency, safety, you know? Uh, uh, fabricatability, assembly, that kind of stuff. Right, right. I think, I think. Um, well, what we presented is really some of the best ways, which is physical testing. You know, so when we're when we're doing mock-ups, not just of terracotta, but of curtain walls in general, um, the whole idea is to kind of put the wall through its paces and even put it uh, put it through pressures and forces and movements beyond what would be expected in the design. To understand how this wall is going to perform, and so with terracotta, I think the focus, uh, in particular, on this project was 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 based um, primarily on the fact that we had a, a building maintenance system that was going to roll down the terracotta itself. So we really wanted to understand what kind of force that would put on the terracotta and come up with a way to really impact it to to confirm that its strength was what we thought it would be. And so we are doing analysis, you know, computer analysis, structural analysis of the, of the elements itself to, to try to understand and predict how it's going to behave, but nothing really takes the place of a physical test. And so even the testing of the rain screen panels, which is where we couldn't test the actual mock-up, we have to take the panels off and construct, you know, uh, uh, chamber specifically for it, tape the joints in a way to at least exercise the panels because there's no other way to pressurize them yep. short of putting them out during a hurricane and, and just and running the test. So um, unfortunately, during a lot of this testing, we don't see breakage, and <laughs> which, is, which is exciting and a good way to understand how it behaves. But, but I, I think in, in certain instances, it's good to actually break the panels uh, to see how it breaks. And then in that particular project, you know, having reinforcements running through the open cells of the terracotta was a good way to kind of say, look, if the terracotta breaks, it's still going to be retained on the wall, even in a broken state. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. Um, I think that's, that's probably not done enough, right? And I think a lot of people take it for granted, um, or may not be aware in the process of, of analyzing, you know, or even doing testing on, on, hybrid enclosure systems, right? Ones that, you know, like a curtain wall system with a with a terracotta cladding on it, right? That the traditional means by which we 
and uh, or, or, or test, you know, do lab tests of, a, of a curtain wall systems, don't really look at the cladding aspect of it, to it, right? They'll, they'll, they'll look at, you know, as far as deflections and, and all that, all that's concerned. So you have to take that additional step and, and make some modified, modified uh, testing to, to be able to do that, right? Especially as something as, as critical um, as, as, a, as a terracotta. Yeah, I think so, as soon as, as, soon yeah, as you have rain screens or anything outside of the building envelope, it becomes yeah. a real challenge to test. Yep, absolutely. So one of the things I wanted to, um, you know, uh, in the context of your of your proposal, as well as a number of of um, projects that uh, that the panelists have worked on, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of examples um, where an additional use characteristic. Um, uh, other than cladding is proposed, such as use as a structural system, David, and yours, right? Um, uh, as a planter, as a home for birds and bees, you know? Um, I think uh, one question I would, I would open to the panel is, you know, do we see, do any of you see terracotta as having more potential to have hybrid functions than other materials that you typically work with? Um, and what do you, and do you have any thoughts on um, the other potential uses or functions for the material? pretty broad question. I think it could be, uh, you know. I'll jump in and say yes. And I think right now, I think the architects are looking to one, keep terracotta out of the VA process. So the more efficient we make it, the more, because um, we got the iconic thing down. So the more function we can add to the behavior of the material and its use on the building, the more interesting it is and the more sustainable it is. And I think right now, People are looking, people are really paying attention to the sustainability aspect of it, whether it be life cycle analysis, um, carbon footprint, or, you know, use, you know, because buildings are pretty big. So the more we can engage the facade, you know, even right now we see that, you know, rooftop gardens are being integrated more and more and more in, in new buildings, because we have we've now recognized that we need a piece of nature in the building and we need accessibility to nature. So if you can't get it by leaving the building, you have to be able to get it in the building. So I think as we move forward, it, it definitely is a very versatile material that has added benefits. That's a really good point, Andre. Oh, I mean, sorry, I was just going to say. I was, I was just going to add that the uh, you know um, terracotta is a you know is perceived as a very uh, you know rich material, right? Not only in <laughs> not only in uh, um, you know architectural quality, but also cost, right? So um, I think any ways that the design team, you know, can work together to give it that added function, as you mentioned, Andre, um, or make it more efficient, um, certainly, certainly helps it, you know, stay, stay uh, a real thing in the project longer. Sorry, I interrupted you, Eric. No, that's all right. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think we see, I think we saw a little bit of it today with HOK's uh, uh, process where uh, terracotta, is going back to doing double duty of being structure as well as as well as the uh, the finish product, and it 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 has that as a, a natural ability just from the just from the type of material it is to be able to be able to do that. And what um where that may head because its behavior turns out its behavior is actually uh, can be similar to glass. And as we've seen glass over the past, let's say decade, probably more, turning more and more into not just being the element that allows light into the building and uh, allows you to see out of the building, but becoming part of the structure itself um, through different manipulations of the glass. We might, I suspect we'll start to see that with terracotta as we push its structural limits um, to make its behavior more predictable in terms of post breakage and, and things like that. Yeah, this, this idea of post tensioning the terracotta you know, to drive compression into it, because it, it's strong in compression, not very strong in tension, similar to glass. Um, but it's also put together differently than glass. Um, although we are seeing some cast glass projects, it's typically using flat sheets of glass and laminating it. With terracotta, we have the ability to create, you know, much more voluminous kind of modules, um, which could be smartly uh, post tension to drive compression into areas where we don't want to see any tension. Um, so it's it's interesting in that respect that we could experiment it in similar ways to concrete, but but uh, but yeah, I think with a little more flexibility. Yeah, the um, the the concept of sort of a 
um, let's say an enhanced terracotta has been, I think, in the in the language of ACOF for since it's since 2016. Um, and I think um, you know, even even where you know we were having conversations um, with Boston Valley about you know how do we make how do we turn the material into a composite like we know GFRC is right like as a with reinforcing. And as you mentioned, David, yeah, there is, you know, um, there are the purity of the material is that it, you know, uh, it also, you know, results in sort of some of its limitations, right? That it's, that there's the tension and the, and the, you know, good, bad intention, good in compression, right? So how do we exploit that uh, to make those high percent? And, and that, that was, that's what's great about the, this year's workshop is that I think there's been a number of teams Right, um, that that have really exploited, you know, um, making these hybrid systems, right, where that incorporate, you know, steel um, and, and terracotta, or um, tensioning in terracotta, or uh, you know, uh, fabric ropes inside the cells for post tensioning, right. Um, so I think there's uh, there's there's a lot to learn from this from this year's um, this year's workshop for sure. All right, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing any questions popping up in the in the audience. Um, let's see here. Nothing specifically, but feel free to ping me again. Uh, oh, here we go. Has anyone tried to laminate a terracotta panel to eliminate the need for reinforcement? Also, the laminate acting as water barrier. So basically a composite material, like, like I was talking about before, but laminating it to, um, to something else. Oh, and I'm also getting told we need, to, uh, we need to move on to the next panel. So if anybody wants to answer that question, I thought we had like a two minutes left, but Omar, I'll, I'll, I'll follow your lead. Um, but if anyone wants to answer that one, then we can move on. I'm not sure personally that laminate material has been proposed other than as a means um, similar to what David had presented to um, address post breakage behavior um, as a, a fiberglass a fiberglass mesh that has been applied to the backside um, through an epoxy coating that bonds the system together if it were to crack. But that's that's all I've under under understood. Anybody else? Yeah, and it's it's not naturally waterproof, especially once it's fired. So once it's fired, um, the glaze helps deal with the waterproofing issue for the most part. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to hand over back to Omar for the next panel. Um, I want to thank the panelists. Um, fantastic job. Fantastic uh, insight into um, uh, the the contribution you made to the design team's work. Um, and uh, and thanks for the, your for your great answers and discussion. So um, thank you all, and uh, look forward to the next panel. Take care. <laughs>